Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to Facking Friday here at Level Effect, July 26th. This is an episode on cyber threat intelligence, the why, the purpose, the need for everything that we do and how to respond to all the cyber threats in this industry. So let's kind of jump into it and talk a little bit about the <laughs> the, the purpose. And I've got chat over here and I've, I have hit record. So what do you all think so far? Like in chat, what do you think the purpose is of cyber threat intelligence? Like distill it down nice and concisely. So the purpose of CTI is to facilitate informing blue team and red team on current tactics in the field. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think, I mean, I, I personally agree with like 90% of that. I think, I think it goes a little bit more than current tactics per se. But I like it. So I guess I see some more active chat. So, I mean, let's, let's think about that for a moment. If we had a web application server with a database that could be revealed or exposed by a user just happened to maybe click on something that they shouldn't have. That's, that's not necessarily a tactic, right? That's not necessarily a TTP, but it does breach several components of the whole CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability piece. Because, see, yeah, so here's another message to chat. So understand why the threat actors are attacking. And you see, I think that's the thing is it was when we, when we start with cyber threat intelligence and we get really, really hung up and we kind of focus on human-based cyber threats or like the direct cause and effect of a human action leading to some type of event or incident. Um, and we usually think about it being intentional. We usually think about it being malicious and that's one part of it. Truthfully, that's, that, that, that's just one part of it. One part of cyber threat intelligence is to understand malicious threat actors intended motives. So chat's asking, won't CTI feed into threat emulation and detection engineering? Yes, 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 it will. So, I mean, I think if we want to kind of like, if we want to break it down, we want to just like distill this down to something easy to digest and understand. Um, cyber threat intelligence really is about us trying to have relative information that can lead us to make a decision on how to mitigate, reduce, and ideally eliminate a cyber threat and overall, uh, and, and basically our cyber risk profile is what we want to be able to reduce. Now, we know inside of cybersecurity that we can't actually eliminate, we can't, we can't be 100% secure. And that's something that we need to kind of come to terms with when we first start, start, start studying this field is because when we first start understanding things, we're like, oh, we just, you know, harden the server, we can configure our, our defenses, add more layers of security, and we're good. And your non-technical stakeholders, so like management, they're just going to want to know like, well, how do, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And those are all very reasonable questions to ask inside of non-security centric types of fields like non-adversarial right um like if you have a customer service agent and you want to make sure that they never have the ability to provide a certain level of information on a customer record you can do that like you can go inside of the system you can design the code that will never let them be able to do that barring some strange event so you like you can really really you, you can get to a point where you're like 99 percent certain like you can almost always get there in a lot of fields where it's non-adversarial. Now, cybersecurity, when we're inside of a field where it's, it's, it's two roles, right? We have the defender and then we have the attacker. We have this constant pivot where we're always trying to secure something to the point where it's still usable by the attacker. <laughs> that's, and that's sort of like the key problem. So it still has to A, be usable by the attacker and we still have to prevent the attacker from being able to abuse it at the same time. And that I think poses a very different scenario compared to someone asking you like, how do we make sure this never happens again? And I think therein lies the problem. So there's a lot that can go wrong from a defender trying to secure their attack surface to make sure that an attacker can still use their attack surface but not compromise it. 
That's something to think about. Because all of my good intentions, right? Like there's a saying like the road to um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? I, I think people like to say that. That's a saying. Um, because you keep thinking you're going to be doing the right thing. You're going to set up some access control, some, some security policy, some layer of protection. But truthfully, um, in doing so, you expose something else. And then you get a cyber risk. And eventually you get a cyber threat. So that's what we're here to talk about today. That, that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, yes, chat. We have to accept that there will always be residual risk. There always will be. So you have to get to a point where, how comfortable are you? So like, imagine your home. If you if you really wanted to make your your home super secure from someone trying to break in, you can go and put like a fifteen foot thick steel wall around your house with like some shutters that close at the top and keep it secure from anything entering. Like like you could do that, right? But then you couldn't get out of your house, <laughs> right? So like that that's that's kind of a way to think about it. Is your home right now? You have you have your doors, locks, a security system, but it's not one hundred percent secure. And it's also not 100% secure from weather events. And if if a fire hit your home or some type of wind or hydro event, like, like, like water, right? And your home became exposed in the process and everyone could see inside your house. I mean, th th that's not a threat actor, right? Like that's, that's just like a natural event that could happen. And you're like, oh damn, like everyone's going to see I didn't do my laundry last week. Um... That, that's kind of what happens when you have general IT problems that just can kind of expose your tax surface without you meaning to. And the threat actor is not even involved, but they're going to see it afterwards, and then they're going to get involved. They're going to be like, oh, okay, so that's what's inside there. So question here is, is a threat hunter a small role in the industry as of now? Smaller, yes. Um... <laughs> We're just trying to get the basics right at this point. Like, we're just trying to get configuration nailed down. Um, we've got a long way to go. A general, like, dedicated threat hunters aren't your typical cybersecurity role. That's more... That's more... More senior, more, like, higher-level security maturity in an organization or maybe, like, a dedicated consulting firm that can do that. Or dedicated um, businesses, like excuse me, like managed service providers and such, they might be able to offer threat hunting. Um, or if your company or organization has secured the perimeter well enough, then you can start performing threat hunting exercises. Um, so truthfully, threat hunting starts to become part of the responsibility of pretty much every cybersecurity professional in your org. I think that's most important when we first start off in cyber threat intelligence is trying to figure out how information is currently presented. I think th that, that'll that really help you before you start anything, before you start looking at like intelligence sources and formatting and data and how do we understand like where to get information inside of an operating system to protect us from a threat. I think it's more important when you first start with cyber threat intelligence is to just take a look at some of the finished like production material to date right now. And I'll kind of, I'll minimize my camera a little bit here, but what you want to see is something kind of like this Verizon data breach report. There's something, so I'm using OBS as a virtual camera and there's some type of layer happening, but yeah, cool, man. Um, so your report is up. I guess you're, you're going to be a little bit part of the presentation now. You don't have to talk if you don't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Okay, cool. So, you know, I've shared a link in chat. Chris has got a shared in screen over here and um, effectively, this is a final production report. And for those of you that aren't familiar yet with cyber threat intelligence and such, um, and I can actually bring my camera back up a little bit here. One second. So for those of you that aren't too familiar with this side of things, there's a, a cyber threat intelligence life cycle. This report doesn't just pop up overnight. There's a very, there's a very layered set of steps that happen to take you here to deliver this type of report. And this is a type of report that is a little bit more on the high level CISO, 
executive decision-making type of um, report delivery. It also does get technical, but it doesn't get into some more specific types of threat intelligence. And when you learn more about that, those are things called like tactical and technical intelligence. And those are specific forms of intelligence that are for technical decision makers, like security analysts, SOC managers, security engineers that can take this and work with it. Similarly, this report is packaged up so that it's providing strategic and operational types of threat intelligence that can be given and disseminated to more t more non-technical decision makers and stakeholders that they can read this and clearly understand the risk to their business or the risk to their industry. So it's a different type of threat intelligence report. And this is why I think it's really important when you first start with CTI, take a look at the current reports in the landscape. And you can do a little bit of Googling to get you there. I always recommend to start off with this one because this is the least technical. This is the in at least my opinion, like it, it, getting this information was very technical to make it in this level of production, but it's the easiest to work with, I think, the most digestible. It gives you a broad understanding of the current industry. Yeah. So Verizon DBR is a, re is a yearly read for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, th th this is honestly one of the best annual reports you can read that gives you a clear picture of the, of the landscape. What are the current trends, current industries that are being targeted? the motives, um, what types of attack vectors. So like, is it email delivery? Is it social engineering? Is it lateral movement? Things that get more complex, it at least gives you an idea and it tells you who's the biggest target. And this is how we know, when you look at a report like this, um, I can't remember the specific statistic from here, but I think it's like seven, it's either four or 7% for social engineering. Um, I can look at that after. Yeah, feel free to do like a control F and look while I'm talking, but it's somewhere around there. Like it, it's a pretty substantial number to the point when if it's when that range, um, I think if you just do like a search for like control F for social, it might, might even come up or you, feel free to kind of poke around. Four, four percent. So <laughs> yeah, see, I raised already on it. Four percent. That means one in 25 Okay, one in 25 of your employees are going to fall victim to a social engineering attack. One in four, All right? So one in 25, if you're looking at like 100 employees kind of thing. Um, actually, that, that, that doesn't make a, a lot of sense what I was saying right there. If it's 4% out of 100, then you're looking at four of your employees. And then if you divide that by four, it's one, one in 25. So one in 25 of your employees, if you had like a small, medium sized team, that's a pretty high number. That means all of your security controls, right? That means your firewall, your web application filter, um, you name it, right? Like you, you, your security permissions on your account, like your MFA, like you, your IT team is always on, on you to, okay, you have to log in with an SMS code, authentication factor, it's, et cetera. All of those controls aren't gonna mean too much if one in 25 of a team, and yeah, so Drew, you're saying we're like, imagine 10,000, right? So 4%, 4% of 10,000 employees, I don't know, like, what is that? 0 0.04 times 10. 400 okay 400 of your employees are going to click on something or be a target of social engineering attacks and it's going to be successful so if you look at the report more in this and you kind of comb through it it actually talks about the level of success that the attacks landed in and whether there was data exfiltration whether there was another user account um, pivoted to whether like horizontal or vertical kind of going up to permission or the same permission scope taking a look at a report like this will tell you that information and this is something if your manager or if you were starting a business and you wanted to understand where are you most likely to be targeted this is the report to read if you're a manager and you're like well how much I have I have 200,000 to spend on security resources this year on top of salary where should I be spending my finances this is the report to read. This is the, you read this to get an idea of what the current successful attacks are. And th this isn't fluff. This is actually built from a framework called the Varus framework. You can look that up as well too. And, and the Varus framework is a very detailed model that allows you to 
organize incidents and events as they happen into categories. And then you have a grid, you, you have a matrix of possible types of attacks. Like, yeah, th there you go. So this framework over here, <laughs> Chris is the, uh, the MVP right over here. Um, if you look at, um, I think it's schema over there at the top. Yeah, so like you can take a look at, at how it's formatted. Um, there's a level of impact, there, there's a victim, um, and, and they break it up into categories. Like th this is a pretty detailed framework to use. It's not it's not something that you would just like, hey, like, w like we just installed the vulnerability scanner in a network and we're looking for vulnerabilities. Let's apply the various framework to capture all of our stuff. No, like th this is a much more secure type of uh, a framework. Nice, yeah, so that, that zoom is good. So yeah, the five sections, so you have incident tracking, uh, victim de demographics, incident, demo incident description, discovery and response and impact assessment. And that actually breaks up even further. It talks about the specific attack vector. So the, the data that's collected to perform the analysis and the collection of the various security events and incidents inside of this industry is then prepared into the Verizon DBIR. So it takes a long time to actually get to that level of report. And I think they sample, correct me if I'm wrong if someone has it in front of them, but I think it's like 2,400 and something or 2,700, it's somewhere within, I think there. It's, it's, it's several thousand incidents that they kind of categorize and they, they look at the ones that are successful and the ones that are not. Um, some of the more high, like higher profile ones, they package it all up and then they prepare this report for you to look at. So that's quite a bit. That's, it, it's a lot to prepare and a lot to do, but cyber threat intelligence is gonna give you the understanding of why you need to do what you do why you need to defend what you should and should not the impact and the resulting consequences if you don't so while it's while it's great to learn about and that's actually yes yeah, so see, see those over there how it's kind of like categorized you can see how they have it inside of it like a grid while it's great to learn how to perform malware traffic analysis on a pcap or it's great to um to learn how to find where windows can be compromised and look at persistence mechanisms. That's all great. Like, like these are important components to cybersecurity from the SOC triage skill set. You need that to be able to classify these events and incidents. That's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of it, a, a good majority of it, is categorizing and understanding everything that's happened so we can get information to take action to mitigate our risk profile. And that is our cyber risk profile. This is why I got, I like to stress how important CTI is. It's going to help you decide where you spend your money, how many staff you should have, how often you're probably going to get attacked, what your staff need to do, what level of controls that they need to implement. It's all CTI. That, that, that like, <laughs> that is all, all CTI. It is an incredibly important domain within cybersecurity and you have dedicated professionals so Chris is over here saying like, this is his, this is his livelihood. This is what he does. Um, you have dedicated professionals within cyber threat intelligence, and you also have cyber threat intelligence components to the various roles inside of cybersecurity. So if like you're, if you're a SOC analyst, what you're doing, like collecting incident response notes and documentation, compiling that and preparing that to, um, to maybe tweak your detection tools or give that to someone else. That's CTI, that's cyber threat intelligence. So it's part and parcel of every single role. And then you have some dedicated professionals that just do it full time. That was a lot of once. I'm gonna pause there, see if Chad has any questions. But as, as you can see, it's actually, it's 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 pretty big. There's, there's a lot to cover on it. So for those of you guys looking at the report or maybe kind of like thinking about what I said, what now do you think about CTI? Like what now do you think about cyber threat intelligence? Yeah, it's intense, it's deep. Yeah, you think as a manager you have to know exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Relevancy, exactly. I haven't talked about that yet, but there is an art to cybersecurity, or sorry, to cyber threat intelligence and I guess cybersecurity. Um, actionable, relative, and timely. 
So Drew, you want to see threat hunting performed based off CTI? Um, you will inside the course. You're you're, you're kind of doing it. You're getting there. Some of the more some of the later modules, especially the whole module in CTI, you're going to be doing that. You're going to be performing some threat hunting based off of um, intelligence indicators and such. Yeah. Definitely, I think, uh, so what I wanted to do is after we kind of talk about these various SOC triage competencies, then I want to make a proper video. And we're going to kind of walk through them all. Like, we'll do a proper incident response scenario, get the CTI out of it, understand what we need to do to prevent and, and remedy the situation, and um, compile into a little report, and then say like, hey, we can, we can build a detection rule based off this. So that's going to be some upcoming videos that I'll record in advance because clearly my my computer does not like me <laughs> yeah go ahead go ahead Chris yes yes I love it yeah I, I for my past students and for like some of the students over here that are gonna be taking the course such you're gonna hear that a lot from me it's inside the course bias is huge the human condition is a very strong component to CTI space. We have a natural affinity to rabbit hole, right? That's called sunk cost fallacy. That's something where you keep on going, even though you're, you're spending too much time. You're like, well, I've spent enough time already. I'm just going to keep doing it. Um, there's confirmation bias. There's a lot of psychology involved to the CTI space, understanding that human element. And bias is so huge. <clears throat> Another important thing too, Chris, that you mentioned, right? That's kind of the clear delineation between compliance and CTI. Because as you start to study CTI, it's a bit of a common pitfall where students are like, oh, you know, this is kind of like a check in the box. If I do these things, if I apply these top best practices and these protocols, I'm safe. And that's actually, that's more of like a compliance mindset. Like a compliance mindset is more, I'm just going to put a check in the box that I have this control suggested to me. Therefore, my security posture increases when... It, it kind of doesn't, it, it helps, but again, it's relative. Whereas CTI is specific to your organization, to your individual needs, number of employees, how long you've been in business, money coming in and out, what tools you have. It's extremely specific to a single organization. And, and that's that's what Chris is talking about there is, is yes, it does kind of feel like each organization has like their own, their own CTI department. Um, and whether they have individual roles or whether it's part of people's positions, everyone, and seriously, it could just be like an Excel spreadsheet. I kid you not, it, it could literally just be an Excel spreadsheet of like the common things IT administrators are seeing inside of a network. Literally, it could just be that. And that could be some organization's CTI department. It doesn't look all fancy like these reports. So that's something to um, keep in mind. <laughs> So we're going to be looking at a couple things. The first thing is going to be um, what are the current trending incidents and events happening within your network? That's going to be like your first area to focus on. So like, what are we currently defending? Are we seeing a lot of login attempts? Are we seeing um, a lot of like, are we seeing problems in our production code that is resulting in disclosure of information? Um, are users able to, in to interact with shares that they're not supposed to be? Are there weird emails coming in th that they're clicking on? Your first area when it's SOC related is capture the trending incidents and events that are happening within your network. And then you're going to start studying how to reduce and mitigate those events from either happening or getting worse. That's going to be kind of like your, that's like your primary thing. Uh, the secondary stage from a SOC perspective is when you feel that you're generally on top of things, like you're managing your network and your, your perimeter security, then you're going to be starting to look at industry trending events. That's when you're looking online. That's when you start to perform like open source intelligence collection gathering, whether that's honestly even hopping on, on Twitter, on Reddit, on intelligence reports like this, um, dark reading, podcasts, like the latest trending events that are happening. There's a variety of different tools that you can go on general open source collection tools. And then there are threat intelligence feeds. And those can be, sometimes they're free, sometimes they're paid. And those are feeds that you can then pull inside of your network, um, whether that's bringing it down to a collection tool for further analysis, or whether that's just downloading it and, and looking at a report offline in another type of reader. So that's kind of what's gonna happen second. Um, 
you're going to use general like OSINT, open source intelligence collection gathering, kind of looking around, and then you're going to get feeds. And then from that, you're going to be able to deduce where the next likely threat's going to be coming in towards your network. And then third, the, the last piece of it is that threat hunting position or, or responsibility. That's when you start getting involved into um, proactive measures. That's, that's, that's adversary emulation. That's, okay, I know what's happening in my network through trends and events. I know, I know what to respond to and look for. And then two, I have collection feeds manually or automatic and collection that I'm, coming, I'm, I'm gathering. And then third is that final piece is you're doing preventative types of scenarios. That's where you're performing adversary emulation derived from steps one and two or on your own research and then seeing how your terrain responds. And by your terrain, that means your detection rules. So like your firewalls, uh, filters, proxies, permissions, alerts, scanners, etc. How is your terrain responding? So, and, and then you just continually put new tactics through it. So like a tactic could be get a regular user account, get them to download a malicious email that you know, or like we call it defanged, like defanged malware. You've taken it out so it can't ever get too bad. Let them open up an Excel document that you know is going to do something strange and then watch what happens. So then like you observe your network, what response went off? Who got notified? Did you even get notified? And then you tweak and tune from there so that type of thing can't happen again. And then I'll talk a little bit more after like why you even want to do that, like where they kind of come from. But those are kind of the three, the three things that you're going to be experiencing from a SOC and, and cybersecurity. Um, you have your internal threats. You have your industry trending um, threats that could be part of your network. And then you have your own research deduced from step one and two to run adversary tactics through your, through your network and see where your, ter your terrain responds to it. That's what we do at Level Effect, Chris. So <laughs> that's kind of what we, we teach our students is we walk them through those three things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, it's... um, Yeah. What does cyber intelligence say? Exactly. <laughs> it, it's... It, the, uh, yeah, because like the thing is, I think a lot of cyber threat intelligence training gets focused around. Um, here's how to do OSINT. Like here's that how to go how to do Google dorking. Here's how to use like Multigo or the dark web or like something sexy. Like we're gonna we're gonna show you how to find like an open port using Shodan on like a camera spying some traffic in the middle of nowhere. Like oh th th this this is CTI. And then you have these courses that teach you this. And to your point, Chris, it's like. Well, how, how is that relative? Like, how does it actually help me? So what we've done in our training is, even from the fundamentals, like, like we're going to teach you wh how it's relative to what you're doing um, as a SOC analyst and, and triaging and performing DFIRS, so digital forensics and incident response. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Yeah, go ahead. Just turn into a podcast. That's what this is. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So everything you just said is exactly what we identified. Um, yeah, <laughs> PR is it a CISO? Yeah, yeah, Alice and chat. That's exactly what we identified. So when we first started instructing and teaching CTI in the first iteration of our training back like like four years ago, we started off initially kind of doing what you said is we said, well, we're going to teach you all the fancy terms, the intelligence lifecycle, like you name it, like, like we're going to like teach you everything about it. And then we're going to also teach you a little bit how to use it. And what we noticed very quickly, very, very quickly was that students got so overwhelmed and hung up on how things should sound, look and structure and be presented that they weren't actually even producing CTI by the end of it. They were just categorizing and organizing data into some level of presentation that looked like CTI, but it wasn't. And an example would have would be like we noticed kind of early on we'd give students these these challenges when they first started cti and it started off okay when they didn't understand like the vocabulary the vernacular the grammar of how to actually communicate cti stuff and they were just like 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 here's a scenario like we found a hash kind of thing like a hash has been discovered on an alert um go and find out like what it means use what we taught you and tell us how we can identify where it came from and prevent it from happening etc they were fine 
like like th- like when we first started it like really really simple basic they were performing and they would find what what it meant and deliver cti and tell someone what to do to prevent it like here's a rule you could run it's this level in the attack life cycle etc and then something weird happened in the middle stage once we're like okay so now we're gonna like teach you stuff like all like the different structure and terms and all that they got so hung up so so hung up on like i said structuring and presenting it that they started to miss fulfilling the requirements like straight up like a full delivered powerpoint presentation full reports that didn't even have the requirements answered so <laughs> something had happened like we looked at it, it's like this is weird like why is this happening and I, I and i think maybe this is a bias this is like our best kind of answer is that once once we told students to sort of how to structure and present something, they just quickly fell into that, that they started to forget what the real objectives were. So we changed the way that we deliver and, and, and train and taught CTI. In fact, now what we do in CTI, so we have created a model. Um, I, I originally just called it the method formerly known as, because I didn't have a name for it at the time. But what it really is, is just applying first principles first to deduce solid intelligence requirements and how you can produce that over time through research techniques. Then towards the end, like the, the last bit of our training with CTI, then we start to say, okay, now that you know how to do it all, structure what you did into these categories. And then, hey, guess what? What you just did is actually the intelligence lifecycle and you also provided strategic operational tactical tactical you also provided a findings table you also provided every like he, you actually delivered a cti report without us telling that you that you did so we actually kind of flipped it around and we've noticed a lot of good success with that with students is we we deliver and we add on the grammar as I, kind of like what i like to call it is we add the grammar later and just teach you how to speak and how to how to use the language and kind of communicate things like kind of like a child would and it's worked very well Students have delivered these fantastic reports and presentations that are communicable to technical and non-technical audiences very well. And by the end of it, they're able to categorize it and structure it properly. It takes a little bit longer, um, I, I would argue. Like you feel like you don't really, you aren't like doing CTI. It's kind of like wax on, wax off, I guess maybe. <laughs> Put it that way. It's like you keep doing this thing like, oh, wait a minute. I actually am doing CTI by the end of it and it works very well. So we've created our own model. It's in the CDA course. It's it's a structure. It's 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 a it's using analytical techniques to deduce threat intelligence based on very solid intellig- intelligence requirements or this, these PIRs that you're talking about inside of chat. Yeah, um, because we have it that your challenges and your reports when you do the the, the live course on on demand. Every module is report deliverable. So by the, you, like, you don't really know it, notice it, but we're layering on the ability for you to prepare CTI and deliver it to someone. That's why the final module is actually CTI. It, like, truthfully, like the final module is CTI. It's actually comprised of CTI and adversary tactics and vulnerability management in, in one split up. But we teach you everything first. And then we kind of tell you, oh, you, you've done it the entire time. And this is how you actually want to structure it now. And off you go. And then you hop inside the sock. So a long answer is just me. I I totally appreciate and understand that because yes, and I think it's easier to say here's an OSINT course, like like, like you said, of how to research things and prepare something, but it doesn't doesn't really help. And then you walk away and you're like, well, I don't know how to do this again. So totally understand. And we learned our lesson too initially because we also tried that at first. So there's your long-winded answer, Chris. Of all that that's what i was gonna say sorry like that that's actually what i wanted to kind of cover today that's what i want to do that so i'm gonna make a proper recording and i'm gonna actually talk about some of this stuff and how we do it and why we why we've seen it to be useful that that is what i was going to talk about today um but i think as a proper recorded video and then a facking friday about it i think it's going to be the new new strategy but go on you had one more I think independently, the best thing that that I've experienced in, in my career is to try to lean on the attack lifecycle itself and figure out 
where the general vulnerabilities are most likely to occur within a given department, within what you understand of your own terrain, your own network, and your own industry. Try to identify where the department falls as a likely target within the attack lifecycle, like a general. You can use a kill chain, you can use whatever you want, but generally from an initial compromise all the way to action objectives, anything in between, identify where they fall or where they were likely to fall within there as a target, and then ask questions on how they could be secure from areas in there. Like if you're looking at accounting, for example, emails, there's a lot of email transfer. A ton. There is so much email transfer going back and forth, checking up the records. There's vendors, so there's third parties. Um, th that means you're sort of like middle to later on in the attack life cycle. But by that point, you're like you don't really need to worry about reconnaissance too much because the reconnaissance is happening on your network security and perimeter. So the counting is not really there. They're kind of back end, same like HR. But a, but an email delivery is going to bypass all that. So you need to understand where they kind of land within that kind of like that timeline. That is what those the questions you need to ask are based on where they land and where they're likely to become a target. That'll help you kind of zero in and stay relative to the threats. You can use the, yeah, I was gonna say, kill chain is good. You can kind of look and make your own assessment looking at even like the flow from like MITRE, like MITRE attack kind of walking from left to right. It's not, it's not exactly chronological, but you can use that as sort of as a model I'm, I like to look at the at the kill chain. I think the kill chain is a pretty good idea of where something could occur, kind of from start to finish. And then think around there and zoom in, and then maybe you can use MITRE ATT&CK to get the specific types of TTPs based on that, on that area. That's kind of how I like to look at it, and it served me well. I think as a first pass is to take a look at the report and identify what are the most, what are the most successful attacks that would be the first thing you want to look at. So let me kind of like zoom in myself over here on this. I think looking at the second section, so the results and analysis, just read kind of pages 11 and 19 is is enough. Like like just going through those types of, of, of graphs, I think is going to help you a ton. Um, and then my second recommendation would be social engineering. So when you're brand new, the easiest thing to understand is email, email delivery, I open up a link, I clicked on something that I shouldn't have. That's what you want to look at. So section two, you kind of want to get an understanding of the results. So like, what is the bottom line? Like what the, the bottom line is, is section two. And then three, you want to read social engineering. So just start there. You don't need to do any more than that. Just start with that. And then maybe come back to it afterwards. You'll, you immediately have something to go and tell your CISO or your manager, you'll be able to tell someone on the street, something that they can work with and they'll be more secure just by reading section two and page 31 there. We do, yeah, we talk a little bit about like report presentation styles. Um, we even refer to like the Bishop Fox styling guys, like how you wanna kind of structure your, your wording and kind of use industry terms. We help you, again, that's stuff that we do later. Like we teach you the bluff, the Bishop Fox, the various ways to kind of communicate it is is later because first we want to get you to be able to produce intelligence and then you can refine it later um, which is actually it, it's it's kind of uh, it's a little bit different than the intelligence life cycle but from a training perspective i think that has just been much more successful for us for students and what we've seen is flip it around a little bit and then they can fall into the intelligence life cycle after but good stuff chris yeah th th these are a lot of good questions um so we're at the one hour mark. I am going to, I'm going to cap it here and I'll try to turn this into some type of recording. It's going to be raw. It's not going to be the best formatted with like a blurry screen and stuff. Maybe I can do some quick editing. I'll try to have it staged so that it's just kind of focusing on the questions and answers as much as I can. But I think, yes, moving forward, what I'm going to do is have a recorded pre-done video talking about some things, and then we're going to move over to a fact and talk about it together and anyone can ask questions. So that's going to be the way to do it from now on. YouTube. Yeah, we'll post these on YouTube over here. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. That's, uh, we try to keep it at like one hour for the fact side. I think yeah, moving forward, the videos are probably going to be like 12, 7 to 12, maybe 15 minutes at most. It's easier to kind of package it up and communicate it. And then we can hop into a fact later on and just like, hey, let's let's just talk about stuff.
kind of do that. But cool. Thank you everyone very much for attending. Thank you for attending Packing Friday, July 26th over here, Level Effect, Cyber Threat Intelligence, and look out for some new uh, formats of things. Coming, it's coming soon. Thank you very much, everyone.